a very simple one, which is saying I don't understand how people can say that we shouldn't be in Europe when we share culture, religion, history, uh, and geography. And the note came back and said, oh, those are all right, but we don't share politics. Now, if we don't share a means of institutionalizing the things we care about and are jointly part of our history, then we won't, it doesn't matter if you share those other things. It's merely a statement. And, and we, what we have to recognize is that we have to have a mechanism whereby we do these things together all the time. I always find people think, well, why don't we have a sort of treaty about this or an agreement about that? That's not how you build proper cooperation. You build cooperation by constantly working together and finding a way through. I used to sit around the table, I suppose, for um, 16 years as a minister, negotiating with other people. And of course, as you moved on, you built relationships and you found it possible to discover ways to do things which you would never have found before. Of course, some newspapers could never understand that this is about compromise. But then everything is about compromise. Uh, so like when we had the coalition, I used to say, we've always had a coalition. John Redwood and I are in the same party. That's a coalition. It's a, you, you have to recognize that even the big parties are, are coalitions. And in Europe, we have to have a mechanism by which we constantly associate with each other and find answers. Now, in the environment, which is my passion, I have to say simply this, half the air pollution in Britain comes from the rest of Europe. So if you aren't part of the rest of Europe, then you only can deal with half your air pollution. It's very simple. It's divided by two. So when people talk about, oh, we're losing sovereignty, we're not losing sovereignty, we're gaining sovereignty. We gain some control over the half we would otherwise have no control over. And as we export half the pollution we produce over to the rest of Europe, they have a right to believe that we should be part of the decision making and that they should be part of the decision making because we are giving them the problems of half of our pollution. And how, what's the point of cleaning up our beaches if the Germans and the Dutch and the French don't clean up theirs? How on earth can we think about birds if we don't think about migrant birds? Because even my lack of knowledge about birds knows that quite a lot of them fly in from elsewhere. If they're shot on the way, we don't get them. I know that's a very unusual comment, but we don't. So if we ought to be part of the organisation that's able actually to care about it. And I want to say something about young people. I mean, apart from the manifestly movie, young people in general don't know what this argument's about. Because they think that the wonderful wildlife centres in Spain are part of their wildlife. They don't think that it's only us that's looking after it. They want to know that things are being looked after properly in Italy because that's where they go. They get on a train now. I don't think the anti-Europeans understand this. A train, you can get to Paris quicker than you can get to Newcastle and you get there and it, it's part of our environment. The idea that it isn't part of our environment is a nonsense. And I want to say one last serious thing, I mean much more serious thing. The thing that moves me most, and I say it even though we're talking about the environment, is simply this. I took my son, aged 18, on his first big journey round the world to the place he wanted to go. I took him to the train and he didn't go to war. And my father took me in that way. This is the first generation in Europe that can say that two generations haven't gone to fight in our internecine incestuous fights. And anybody who thinks that's happened by accident is a fool. It's happened because we've learned to live together and discover ways of working things out together. And the environment has a prize example of that. Most fisheries in Europe are shared, not because of the common fisheries policy, but because they've always been shared. It's always been true. But in the past, because we haven't been greedy and because we didn't have the equipment that made it possible for us to be greedy, there were enough fish for all. And if there weren't, 
you solved it by hitting somebody over the head with a marlin spike. That's how it happened. What the common fisheries policy does now is to enable us to make these decisions together. And if they're the wrong decisions, that's because the policy is wrong, not because it's common. And there is no way of having a fisheries policy that isn't common. And, of course, like everything else about Brexit, they don't tell you what happens afterwards. So how do you look after the <coughs> fisheries? You can only do it by having a common policy. And so you're still back in the argument about what that policy ought to be. So for goodness sake, ask the right question. The question about fisheries is not, should we have a common policy? That is inevitable and essential. The question is, have we got the right policy? Well, it's a darn sight better now than it was. There's a long way to go. But we're not going to get there by saying to the rest of Europe, we're incredibly superior. And we know the answers to all these things. And the answer is, you do what we want. Because I'll tell you the facts. They're bigger than we are. And there are more of them. And they have more fishing boats. And they have more control, legal control, over the fisheries. So do you know what's going to happen? They're going to say to us, you're going to do what we want you to do, and you don't have a vote. And they're not just going to say that over fisheries. They're going to say that about everything else because we have said to them that we're not prepared to cooperate. What we want to do is to control. And we as Brits have got to learn that in this new world, this is the beginning of the way the new world will work. And I'll come back to where I started. The Committee on Climate Change knows that we can only solve climate change by everybody working together. We know that imperialism is over. There's no longer a place for some people saying that they know best and everybody else must do what they say. Everything has to be done together. And if we can't get on with our neighbours in Europe, how the hell are we going to get on with people in Bangladesh and in Malaysia and other countries where we don't share geography, history, culture and religion? We've got to learn to do it here. And if we fail here, then we'll fail everywhere. Bravo.